So we may only be a couple of months into 2023, but already we've had some seriously beefy camera phones hit in the UK. From 200 megapixel mega monsters to blowers packing a one inch sensor so they can practically see in the dark. And I've been eagerly testing them all out, mostly by going to pubs and snapping pictures of beer and then drinking that beer until my photos and the world in general get a bit fuzzy. So here's my pick of the very best camera phones you can grab yourself right now in 2023. And for more on the latest and greatest tech, please do plug subscribe and ding that notifications bell. Cheers! So one of the most obvious choices for proper good smartphone optics is Google's Pixel 7 or the more expensive but even more impressive Pixel 7 Pro. These flagship phones are less expensive than some rivals but they serve up some seriously slick hardware and a shag load of excellent Pixel exclusive features that make life just that little bit easier. That Tensor chipset isn't as beefy as Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon but the Pixel 7 phones can still blaze through a bit of Genshin impact on demand while battery life is pretty bloody good too. When it comes to the cameras, that primary sensor hasn't changed up at all from last year's 50 megapixel Octopd quad beer effort. And I would say it's a mite disappointing that there's no hardware upgrade here, but as that old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't f**k about with it. And things most certainly ain't broke because the Pixel 7 pair boasts the best point and shoot camera performance of any smartphone in 2022. When you're shooting people or animals, you can swap to the excellent portrait mode and get gorgeous results with bokeh that you can mess about with in post-processing if you wanna. And the pixels boast a swift shutter speed too, so you can capture loads of photos in quick succession and make sure you nail those blink and you'll miss a moments. Complicated shots tainted with strong contrast aren't a problem either, especially using Google's handy on-screen brightness sliders. And even if the lighting is full on, you won't see much saturation and colors will appear natural. Google's night vision mode can be automatically activated by the phone whenever the lighting is cack and I would recommend not fiddling with that particular setting as it makes a real difference, essentially allowing you to see in the dark. Absolutely stellar stuff. And both Pixel 7 smartphones also offer up a alternative 12 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter. And while colours aren't quite as realistic with this option, it is there if you want to fit more into frame. Now when it comes to that camera tech, the major advantage that the Pixel 7 Pro has over its regular sibling is the fact that it's got a 48 megapixel telephoto lens on there with five times optical zoom. And that's bolstered by a bit of optical image stabilization just like the primary shooter and it's an option that's just straight up cut out of the regular Pixel 7. When you're capturing a photo between 2.5 times and 5 times zoom levels, you'll end up with a hybrid photo stitched together from images taken with the primary and the telephoto sensors, meaning pleasingly crisp detail and no compromises. And when you push in over the 5 times zoom level, it's telephoto all the way. And I've got to say, even most of the way up to the 30 times zoom cap, I got some bloody good results. This is easily one of the best telephoto shooters that I've ever tested, perfect for snapping kids, pets, anything that you don't want to disturb for natural looking images. Even in very low light, it doesn't fall apart, producing quite crisp results with help from that stabilization. And I got to admit, I really missed that telephoto option whenever I was just snapping away with the regular Pixel 7. Yeah, it's, it's just like, oh, why? Arr. Switch things up with a bit of video. And again, these pixels do a great job with minimal effort. You don't have an AK option, but my 4K test clips were crisp and detailed enough to enjoy on a telly screen, with detail levels only really dropping when the lighting became more problematic. Vibrant colours are again ably captured, and you can swap between all of the lenses as you record. And this isn't too jarring, although colour accuracy does take a hit when you're away from that primary sensor. The telephoto lens on the Pixel 7 Pro is particularly impressive in low light, while the optical image stabilisation once again counters any vicious hand sway, caused by a few too many surprisingly strong lagers. And as for audio, well, I'd have preferred some better wind cancellation, but otherwise it's top stuff. The Pixel 7s come with a cinematic mode, which, like Samsung's portrait video mode, adds a bokeh style effect behind your subject, although a month on this hasn't improved at all. If your subject moves at all, the Pixel easily loses track and goes a bit berserk, so for now, just avoid. And likewise, all the motion stuff which can add fake motion blur or mimic a long exposure shot is okay, but it can be quite shonky and frankly feels a bit gimmicky and I imagine most people wouldn't even bother touching it. And if you get yourself the Pixel 7 Pro, where well, you'll also find you've got a macro mode on board, 
And this can automatically activate whenever you get really, really close up to something. We're talking like a couple of centimeters away. What it does is it automatically switches to the ultra wide angle shooter, which on the Pro has an auto focus, unlike the regular Pixel 7, hence you don't get that macro mode here. And the results aren't bad at all, although I still prefer to just take high res images on phones with massive camera sensors and then simply crop in as you don't have any stress from shadows or other issues. And one of the other new highlights of taking photos on these Pixel phones is the photo de-blur feature as well, which to be honest, I really didn't have to use very often at all because it's very rare to get a blurry shot on these two. And I gotta admit, I'm still not convinced. It can help a little bit with blur, but it's not quite the miracle tool that some are making it out to be. It's certainly not as immediately valuable and impressive as Google's tool, which wipes out any background stragglers, effectively eliminating them from existence. But hopefully over time, with a good bit of machine learning or whatever, that de blur tool will really be worth its weight in gold. And last up for the optics, both Pixel 7 phones pack a simple 10.8 meg fixed focus selfie shooter, which has been okay for those social media snaps. In low light, it's once again sometimes a bit crap, vomiting out blurry, unsavory pics, especially if you're not entirely still. Definitely best used when conditions are favorable. Now, if you can't quite stretch to some Pixel 7 action, well, no bother. Google's Pixel 6a is a fraction of the price and yet still offers a great selection of features and some dependable hardware. The camera sensors may be older tech, but the 6a can still capture better looking pics than basically any mid-range mobile out there. Now, 12.2 meg primary setup comes with built-in optical image stabilization, and it's ideal for snapping anything and everything your gorgeous little heart desires. It's a real point and shoot effort. Just aim the camera in generally the right direction, and that's about all the brain power you'll need to get good looking photos. If you're struggling against a bright background or some other HDR shenanigans, you can manually tweak the exposure levels with a quick swipe of your finger, an easy alteration for even better results. Google's cameras are masters when it comes to capturing colors just as they look in real life, even when the light is a bit pants. And night sight is fully automatic these days, so as long as you keep your hands still for a second or so, you'll get bright pics that aren't plagued by noise. And unlike most other manufacturers, Google does only serve up a very small selection of bonus camera modes and tools to play around with. So for instance, there's no pro mode to speak of, but there is a portrait mode that can be depended on to keep your subject crisp while smudging out the background. And the Pixel 6a also gives you the option of a 12 meg ultra wide shooter, which unlike most rivals can once again capture pretty natural looking snaps. Colors aren't distorted too much beyond a slight deepening of those bright blue skies and so on. For your home movies, you can shoot 4K video at 30 or 60 frames per second. And again, I approve of the stuff that this thing churns out. Vivid colors are again captured in full glory with plenty of details stuffed into every frame. Image stabilization impresses, keeping the picture as still as possible, even when you're walking at pace or piddling about on a boat. And any voices chatting around the phone are cleanly picked up, even against full-on background noise. It's only when things get a bit darker that the Pixel 6a struggles, serving up quite murky results overall. Now, the only real disappointment with the old Pixel 6 camera setup was the selfie camera, which proved frustratingly limited compared with the rear optics. Hence, I didn't exactly have high expectations when it came to snapping my mug with the Pixel 6a. Thankfully, this selfie shooter is actually pretty good, even when you move indoors into quite dingy spaces, as long as you and any fellow selfies aren't flapping about the place. It's not too phased by high contrast shenanigans either. And again, like video capture, it's not until things get proper dark that it all gets a bit murky and not very nice to look at. And if you want to shoot a vlog or something with that front facing camera, it's full HD resolution capture, no 4K option, sadly. It's quite zoomed in as well, and you don't have an option to zoom out, just zoom in even further, which, oh, nobody needs that. Now, a hot rival for the Pixel 7 phones comes courtesy of Apple with its latest iPhone 14 series of smartphones, and they're just as flamboyant camera design. If you want the beefiest hardware, you will need to spunk out a grand for the Pro or Pro Max models, which sport a fresh new 48 megapixel sensor with upgraded optical image stabilization. But does that mean that your photos and videos will look even nicer than ever before? Well, in general, the iPhone performs really well with natural lighting, and even quite harsh conditions like shooting into the sun won't automatically mean you get a terrible pick. Halo effects and flare aren't too bad at all, if not quite as good as rival phones with Zeiss lenses. Snap a pic of a vibrant subject like a pretty flower or this frankly ugly pumpkin which looks like a stomach twist in close-up of a teenager's facial pose and you'll get eye-creamingly pleasing results. 
The sweep and vistas also tend to come out well, packed with impressive detail and boasted natural sky tones. My portrait shots also looked rather lovely, with a successful bit of bokeh style blurring and the usual filters for more extreme effects. Unfortunately, ambient and low light shots can look rather flat and grainy still, despite the larger sensor and pixel binning, while moving subjects will inevitably end up all blurry. It's here that the Pixel phones show their superiority, especially as Apple's night mode isn't quite as dependable as Google's night sight. Once again, the Pro Max comes packing a 12 megapixel ultra wide angle lens with 120 degree field of view, and this can again cope quite well with strong HDR situations with only slightly warmer colours on display. And this is also automatically swapped to for macro shots if that's right up your alley. When you start to zoom, the primary sensor handles the action until you hit the three times level, at which point the dedicated 12 meg telephoto shooter takes over. This serves up more basic optical image stabilization, but it's still more than good enough to get a stable shot without much trouble. Unfortunately, however, the maximum zoom here is 15 times, which is inferior to many Android rivals. But while the likes of the Pixel 7 Pro offers sharper, better looking telephoto pics, the iPhone should satisfy anyone who's hoping to get a perfect touristy shot or just an unobtrusive snap of the kids, cats, whatever. For home movies, you can capture footage at up to 4K resolution with your choice of 24, 30 or 60 frames per second. This once again stumbles somewhat in low light conditions, offering murky visuals and some soft focus which pales in comparisons to rivals like Oppo's Find X5. But in better light, you will get sharp, attractive looking video with minimal disruption when you're cycling between the different lenses. You've also got a cinematic mode which adds bokeh style blur into your footage and you've got an action mode too which helps to smooth out your video when you are moving and shooting simultaneously. No bother with audio capture either, those mics do a bang up job. And then last up for your selfie needs, you've got a 12 meg camera with autofocus and it's the same old story here. This works just fine in most lighting conditions but things do get grainy and blurry when the lighting ain't great. And with that front facing selfie cam you can also shoot up to 4K resolution Ultra HD footage at either 24 or 30 frames per second and again absolutely spot on for a bit of Skype and Zoom and whatever else you need to do. Now one of the biggest smartphones to launch thus far in 2023 in both a metaphorical and a literal sense is Samsung's Galaxy S23 Ultra. This 6.8 inch Titan serves up all of the usual features including a lush AMOLED screen and of course that nifty S Pen stylus. Plus you've got plenty of power thanks to Qualcomm's Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 replacing the usual disappointing Exynos effort. But while the regular S23 and the S23 Plus rather boringly stuck with very familiar camera hardware, Sammy at least slapped a fresh new 200 megapixel sensor on the S23 Ultra for improved low light photography. Now this is actually Samsung's Isocell HP2 sensor which is the same size as last year's 108 meg sensor found in the S22 Ultra and not as big as sensors found in rivals like the Xiaomi 13 Pro or the Vivo X90 Pro. But of course image processing also plays a large part in photo and video quality and that's one area that Samsung reckons it has improved for this generation. By default the Ultra's 200 meg sensor uses 16 in 1 pixel binning versus 9 in 1 on the S22 Ultra while also benefiting from Samsung's enhanced super quad pixel autofocus which uses the 200 meg sensor to accurately determine distances and keep your subject perfectly crisp. I didn't really notice much difference when it came to daylight shots on the S23 Ultra, you still get crisp, detail packed pics with some lovely punchy colour reproduction as well. Night shots on the S23 Ultra can still look a little bit soft and you will certainly see some blur with moving subjects and some rival smartphones like the Vivo X90 Pro with its massive one inch sensor do produce brighter results in general but I think I actually prefer the more natural output that you get from the Samsung S23 Ultra with tones that are much closer to what you'll see with the naked eye. Strong contrast is usually handled well without much saturation in those brighter bits while pics are finely detailed as long as things don't get too dark. Now Samsung loves a bonus camera mode, you've got the usual fare on here including that dependable portrait mode. As usual this adds a lovely adjustable bokeh style background action to your snaps. As ever, it is completely befuddled by wild hair, but you can adjust the intensity of the bokeh effect in Samsung's gallery app. And those night portraits do look rather ruddy lush. And then if we skip along into more, you'll find lots more crams in here, including the usual pro mode. This allows you to tinker with the various camera settings, get a very precise kind of output. And Samsung's expert raw app is back in action, easily accessible via that camera menu. And you've now got the option of jumping right up to 50 megapixels. You're not limited to just 12 megapixels as you were on last year's Ultra. 
The S23 Ultra can automatically switch to the likes of night mode and food mode when it detects the conditions are a bit crap or you're trying to take a snap of a burger or whatever. Good old single take as well, one of my favourites. And then as well as the 200 meg main sensor here on the S23 Ultra, you also have three other lenses to choose from. These are decidedly less interesting, however, because they're the same lenses slapped on last year's S22 Ultra. So you've got a 12 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter and then a pair of 10 megapixel telephoto snappers, three times zoom, and 10 times zoom, whoa, freaky. And as usual, those telephoto shooters are impressive stuff, allowing you to get closer to the action without intruding. And as usual, if you want to, you can pinch in all the way up to 100 times zoom, although things get a bit grainy and crappy above about the 20 times level. And if you want to shoot some video, well, you've got the usual 4K options at 30 or 60 frames per second. Otherwise, you can capture 8K resolution footage now at 30 frames per second rather than 24 FPS. Now video is absolutely a highlight here, as usual with Samsung smartphones. Even at that 8K resolution, the stabilization is sublime. You can wander around while shooting and everything stays smooth. When things get dark, the visuals do get a lot softer and that focus can struggle a bit. So I'd say try not to shoot too much video in really low light environments. That's definitely a bit of a letdown. And when you're shooting in a really noisy place, the Galaxy S23 Ultra still does an impressive bang up job of picking up on everything that has been said in front and behind of the lenses. And speaking of lenses, you can swap between all of them while shooting 4K resolution footage or lower with a pretty smooth transition overall. And then if we flip around to the front facing selfie cam, you don't get a 40 megapixel selfie shooter on the S23 Ultra like you did with last year's S22 Ultra. Instead, it's only a 12 meg effort now. And yeah, I'm not really a selfies guy because, well, look at me, but I found that the S23 Ultra did an okay job of capturing my haggard colourless complexion even at night. But good news for any vlogging fans because you can actually capture 4K resolution of video using that front facing selfie cam at 30 or 60 frames per second, which very few other smartphones allow you to do. And certainly for Skyping and zooming, I come through loud and clear on the audio and don't look like a total bag of arse, so that's always a bonus. And if you can't quite stretch to the slightly scary asking price of the S23 Ultra, you might find a good deal on last year's S22 Ultra. The Exynos chipset in half as impressive as the Snapdragon, but there's no denying those optics are still mightily impressive, if not quite as outstanding in low light. The S22 Ultra churns out good looking photos 9 times out of 10 with very little effort. I did see a little saturation in some of my test photos when the sun was being a proper knob and shining in a really awkward place, but in most circumstances the S22 Ultra can happily deal with strong lighting and deep contrast. That focus is fast acting, as is the image processing, so you'll rarely miss a shot because the camera can't keep up. Indoor shots can certainly still look a little soft and warm, unless the lighting is particularly good, but the S22 Ultra can still make the most of the situation more often than not, as long as your subject isn't doing anything annoying like moving about the place. Any flapping can really flummox this phone. And at night, the Ultra really excels compared with many rivals. Only the very best phones like the Oppo Find X5 Pro and the Pixel 6 can replicate a scene so vividly with so little light to work with. The dedicated night mode can also help brighten up things a bit when needed. Meanwhile, the ultra wide angle shooter serves up an eye catch and pulled back view when you're snapping some scenery and without too much distortion or other issues. Colors are a bit off at night and in low light, but overall, it's still one of the better efforts out there. However, the real reason to get the Ultra over other Samsung smartphones is the ridiculous space zoom. Up to around the 30 time zoom mark, you'll still get sharp detailed shots, which is an absolute godsend when you're trying to snap wildlife or kids without intruding on the action. It even works pretty well at night, although whatever the conditions, once you pass that 30 time zoom level, you will notice that the detail in your pics drops quite dramatically, and by 50 times and above, things are looking decidedly dire. As ever, Samsung has piled a ton of bonus camera modes into the Ultra, including a food mode which does actually make your grub look more appetizing. The portrait mode usually works pretty well, adding a convincing bokeh style effect to your photos, although if you are unhappy you can always reverse the effect afterwards. And then there's my personal favourite, the single take mode, which spats out a whole bunch of quirky photos and video clips captured over a short time frame, definitely perfect for shooting your kids' random antics. I also highly rate the Samsung S22 Ultra when it comes to the home movies. That stabilization is fantastic, even at 4K resolution. You can actually shoot smooth looking footage when you're dangling from a Jeep and even when you're aiming at a moving subject while using the telephoto lens. 
although don't zoom in too far or yes this will likely happen. Swapping between the different lenses is a relatively smooth experience giving you the flexibility to zoom in and out with just a quick tap while recording. Moving subjects look smooth on playback and as with snapping photos, as long as the lighting conditions are decent, you will get plenty of detail packed into every frame. Shooting video at night isn't much of a problem either, if not quite as impressive as the Find X5 phones. Things can get a bit grainy, but no worse than with many other handsets. An audio pickup is just as good. My test videos boast rich stereo sound with clear recording from all directions, but favouring whatever is directly in front of the lens. The selfie shooter does a decent job too. Like the rear cam, this can handle strong lighting without having a breakdown, while the view can be expanded if you want to fit in more mates or more background action. Again, in low light, the results can be a bit soft and grainy, and you will want to keep your hands super steady to avoid any blur. Not an easy task when clutching a massive beer, having already drunk two massive beers. Another magnificent camera phone that hit the UK in 2022 is the Oppo Find X5 Pro. This is a gold star smartphone in pretty much every area, from the excellent battery life to the tip-top performance and that satisfying user experience. But the real highlight here is that versatile camera setup, even if the telephoto lens isn't quite as impressive as some rivals. The primary sensor is Sony's IMX766, which has been used by quite a lot of smartphones recently, but Oppo has added extra smarts in there to ensure top quality results. So for one, you've got some next level 5-axis image stabilisation built into this thing, supposed to help you out with your low-light photography. You've also got a lens which is constructed from glass, and that'll help prevent any, you know, halo and effects or the light-based shenanigans that might bugger up your shot. And most importantly, photos are processed by Oppo's own Marasilicon Imogen NPU rather than the Snapdragon chipset that runs the show. But does this actually make for more realistic, good-looking pics? Well, the Oppo Find X5 Pro is a very dependable snapper at least 9 times out of 10. The majority of my test shots taken in auto mode came out remarkably true to life, with similar results to Google's excellent Pixel 6 smartphones. HDR situations are generally well handled, with plenty of details still popping up in those darker areas, and not much flaring in the lighter bits, although I definitely did see some saturation in some of my test photos. Those colours occasionally come out a little bit bleached, nothing extreme, but it definitely does make your pick look less pretty. Good news if you're a night owl, because I got next to no blur in my evening shots thanks to the excellent stabilisation, even after I'd quaffed quite a few shandies. Although if your subject is moving as you take the shot, this will result in some blurry shenanigans. But colour reproduction is again close to natural, even when the light is rather sparse, and you still get a good amount of detail crammed into every frame. The camera software has actually been updated a couple of times since I started testing out the Oppo Find X5 Pro, although I haven't noticed any real change in the performance to be perfectly honest. I'm kind of hoping that they do manage to deal retroactively with some of the saturation issues though. Now one of the snazzy exclusive new features here are the three new Hasselblad Master style filters as designed by a trio of pro photographer dudes. And they are Radiance, Serenity and Emerald. My favourite is definitely Radiance because this turns the sky a crazy cartoonish colour that makes every outdoor photo really stand out. You've also now got the lovably bonkers Hasselblad X-Pan mode, which replicates a vintage shooting experience with a panorama style 65 by 24 aspect ratio. I'm not sure when this would ever really come in useful to be honest, but whatever, it is fun to bugger about with occasionally. And the Oppo Find X5 Pro also serves up a 50 megapixel ultra wide angle lens with a 110 degree view and the image processing is once again powered by Marisilicon like all the other cameras here. If the lighting is strong you'll generally capture natural tones again although you do often end up with colder photos in sort of lower light but even then you'll generally still get crisp photos stuffed with detail and it is a proper lifesaver when you're trying to shoot touristy pics of massive buggers like this thing. And last up is the 13 megapixel telephoto lens with its 2 times optical zoom. You don't get any periscope tech here unfortunately, so this isn't as effective as some rivals like the S22 Ultra. This maxes out at a 20 times zoom, and to be honest there's no real point in going above 10 times zoom level, because at that point things are generally starting to look a bit fuzzy and occasionally not quite in focus. Still, at that 10 times level I found I got pretty much always a consistently good shot of a distant subject. You could also punch in towards a living subject like a fluffy kitty cat without intruding in their personal space. 
Now let's shift on to video, which you can capture up to 4K resolution at either 30 or 60 frames per second. Even at that Ultra HD setting, you'll get smooth visuals when you're moving and shooting thanks to the excellent stabilisation, while the image quality in general is crisp and appealing. The Finex 5 Pro works well in HDR situations, capturing stronger detail in the lighter and the darker areas compared with some of the competition. You can zoom in and out easily enough, and the phone automatically swaps between the lenses to suit without too jarring an effect. Noise levels are minimal when you're shooting at night as well, courtesy of that good old Mazza processing unit, although this does tend to drain the battery life quite quickly. And no real complaints on the audio side, the phone captures everything going on all around without much wind distortion when things do get a bit gusty. And last up, that 32 megapixel selfie cam is another solid effort. Snap away in sunnier climbs and you'll still enjoy sharp, well-balanced pics, no worries. Those filters are back in action as well, although radiance ain't quite as effective with this lens, sadly. In more ambient light, you will get softer results and once again some blur as well if anyone actually dares to move, so you'll definitely want to pause and freeze. But the Oppo Find X5 Pro can automatically switch viewing angles to fit in extra heads when needed, which is a nice touch. If you don't have over a grand to spunk on your new smartphone, well, maybe check out the regular Oppo Find X5 instead, which costs a few hundred quid less, but still packs some excellent optics. And the fresh new Find X6 series of smartphones should be launching literally any week now, so definitely keep your eye on the spurts. I'll hopefully bring you some hands-on fondly action soon and get a chance to fully test out the fresh new 2023 camera tech. Now, one camera phone that is a bit trickier to track down here in the West, but is well worth the effort, is the Vivo X90 Pro. This sports some seriously premium specs, including the MediaTek Dimensity 9200 chipset with a massive vapor chamber so gaming fans can smash through Genshin all evening long. Plus, you've got a big old battery with 120 watt wires and 50 watt wireless charging support. But it is the almighty one inch camera sensor that really impresses. You've got Vivo's usual camera app on the X90 Pro and it is an action packed affair, lots of toggles and modes. So for instance, you've got the Zeiss natural color mode, which is active by default. You can knock this off if you want more vivid, vibrant colors. That's definitely a good one to leave on if you want more natural looking hues. The Vivo X90 Pro proves a worthy flagship camera phone to rival most of the big boys out there. My everyday test shots look sharp enough on bigger displays with accurate colors on show when that Zeiss mode was active. And that combination of the mighty one inch sensor and that V2 chip means that low light shots are impressively bright. Once again, with a strong amount of fine detail packed into every frame, especially when you're using that night mode. However, those tones don't often look as natural as I would have liked compared with some rivals like the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra and the Pixel 7 Pro. Strong contrast can also throw the Vivo quite shockingly in the evenings. And as ever, if your subject is moving when the shutter activates, you will get blurry NAF results. You've got plenty of other modes to check out here on the Vivo X90 Pro, including the obligatory portrait mode. This actually uses a separate 50 megapixel portrait sensor, the IMX758, with optical image stabilization again, plus 4 in 1 pixel binning for better looking night shots. Now, that portrait shooter did occasionally struggle to focus on my subject in lower light, although when it didn't bulk up, the results were usually pretty bloody decent. However, you can expect some rather extreme smoothing when using it with pets. You've got all kinds of different filters you can play around with here, including Cine Flare. So while that T-Star glass is supposed to prevent lens flaring and the rest, if you decide you actually want a bit of that, well, this'll do the job. There's a shag load of other bonus camera modes as well, including a high resolution effort which shoots 50 megapixel photos by default. And you've got a dedicated pro mode as well, so you can fiddle around with the likes of the ISO levels, the shutter speed, the white balance. And again, with the option of that Zeiss natural color, and you can also shoot in RAW. And where you want to shoot a bit of whole movie action where you can capture 4K Ultra HD footage at 30 or 60 frames per second or even bump it up to 8K resolution at 24 FPS. And I gotta say I liked a lot of the test footage that the Vivo spaffed out. Suddenly in those higher resolutions you've got a good amount of detail packed into every frame and even in low light situations things don't get too grainy or noisy and the focus seems to actually work alright now. Solid audio capture from all directions as well so overall for your whole movie action it's great stuff. And before we have a squint at the selfie cam, you've also got a third 12 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter here on the back end of the Vivo X90 Pro. It's the IMX663. And this is absolutely fine for getting a more pulled back view of the action, fit a bit more into frame. 
No telephoto shooter, sadly, unlike a fair amount of other premium flagship smartphones out there. But to be fair, that's a pretty decent camera setup and you do have that high resolution mode, which you can always swap to if you do want to capture a 50 megapixel image and then crop in. And then last up for the camera tech here on the X90 Pro is a 32 megapixel selfie snapper. I'm not really a selfie fan at the best of times, but the Vivo did a respectable job. When I switched to portrait mode, I did find that I looked even more washed out than I actually do in real life. But apart from that, certainly did the job for your shareable shots. There's no 4K mode when you're shooting video with the front facing selfie cam, though it does top off at 1080p Full HD at either 30 or 60 frames per second. And when I've been doing a bit of Skyping and Zooming and stuff for this thing, absolutely no issues with people picking up on my voice. No one's complained that I look even worse than I usually do. Now, another of my favorite flagship smartphones of 2023 so far is the Xiaomi 13 Pro, which comes packing top tier tech, including a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 2 for silky smooth performance, as well as some serious media chops. And once again, you get that almighty one inch Sony sensor that Vivo stuffed inside of its X90 Pro. The end result is incredibly bright and detailed photos in low light situations. The Xiaomi 13 Pro really can see in the dark, producing colourful pics with tonal details that the naked eye simply can't pick up. It's right up there with the Pixel 7 and the Galaxy S23 Ultra, coming somewhere just in between as far as colour accuracy is concerned. Just make sure that your subject is actually still in dim conditions because, as usual, you will end up with fuzzy results if they're not. When you venture out into daylight, you'll get beautifully sharp 12 megapixel snaps. Leica Vibrant is the recommended camera mode, which like Samsung smartphones, boosts those colors to make your photos look a little bit more lively. Otherwise, you can go with Leica Authentic if you want a more natural pick. It's entirely down to personal taste as to which you'll prefer, but I do like those poppy blue skies with the Vibrant mode on. And this time, your subject doesn't need to worry about pausing. That shutter speed and processing time is so fast that it's basically instant. Even awkward dynamic range doesn't throw this blower to the point where you can almost shoot directly into the sun. If you want to get a wee bit closer to your subject without distracting them or just because they're a fair distance away, the Xiaomi 13 Pro also serves up a 50 meg telephoto lens with 3.2 times optical zoom and again OIS. It's not quite the S23 Ultra, but it's certainly useful, especially as tricky conditions like strong contrast rarely muff things up. And while you can actually zoom all the way into the 100 times level, things do get a wee bit abstract beyond about 30 times, at which point you might as well just use your imagination. That telephoto lens is also useful for portrait shots, and once again the Xiaomi 13 Pro excels here, even when your subject is bouncing around like a cooked up bunny. My test shots almost always came out clean with a lovely bulky effect in the background. And last up, there's a 50 meg ultra wide angle shooter serving up a 115 degree field of view. And it's pretty bloody good as far as ultra wides go, as long as you don't rely on it in dodgy lighting. And as always, you've got a healthy selection of bonus camera modes slapped here on the Xiaomi 13 Pro, including a Pro mode, how very apt, which can capture 10 bit raw images. Swap to video and this handset can film some supremely sharp 8K footage, or you can always activate Dolby Vision mode at 4K 60fps. Although even without HDR switched on, the Xiaomi 13 Pro coped well with harsh lighting and my test clips boasted natural looking colours. Even at 8K, the stabilisation here is seriously good. Hyper OIS for the win, baby. You can zoom in and out smoothly if you want to without a particularly jarring transition when swapping to the likes of the telephoto lens, while voices are clearly captured from all directions with minimal wind distortion. So overall, proper lush. And last up, that 32 megapixel selfie shooter can't quite see in the dark like the rear camera, but you do have a slightly startling screen flash mode to help out. Otherwise, in more ambient environments, the Xiaomi 13 Pro still pumps out a good snap without too much invader noise. Brighter backgrounds will be completely blown out, but your mug stays perfectly in focus, and I found that my skin tone, or lack thereof, was quite accurately captured. And hey, if you want to shoot a bit of vlog action using the Xiaomi 13 Pro, well, you can do that at full HD resolution, sadly no 4K action for that front facer. But again, I found this phone was absolutely perfect for Skyping, Zooming, WhatsApping, whatever else. And yet another 200 megapixel monster like the S23 Ultra is Motorola's Edge 30 Ultra, a near 7-inch beast that boasts high-end specs, but this time with more of a stock Android vibe. It's an enjoyable everyday blower and that 200 meg camera is a beaut, although once again don't expect a full res image every time you hit the shutter button. 
I turned on the Smart High Resolution feature in the Ultra's drag down settings before I began testing and I found that this activated basically all of the time when shooting daytime snaps, giving you 50 meg images that are packed with fine detail and rather natural looking colours. It's only in more ambient conditions where that pixel binning is ramped up to brighten your shot and this results in a 12.6 meg image that still often looks good when you check it out on a bigger screen although dim light does mean a serious detail drop. Alternatively, Motorola has also included a 200 megapixel ultra res mode which can capture finer detail in decent light. It takes a wee while to shoot a pic but it's handy if you later want to crop into a photo in lieu of a proper dedicated telephoto lens. Of course these snaps are bloody massive in size, often weighing in at around the sort of 50 to 60 megabyte range so you'll want to use this feature sparingly. The Moto Edge 30 Ultra's massive sensor can absorb a lot of light which works out great for your low light shots as does the optical image stabilisation to counter any small handshakes. The night mode still helps to slightly boost the brightness on occasion but often it's not even necessary. So overall, gotta say, I was impressed by the Moto Edge 30 Ultra's main camera. It's versatile and it's not put off by crappy or harsh lighting. And you've also got the usual Motorola AI help as well if you don't want to think too hard about framing your shot. You've also got yourself a 50 meg ultra wide angle shooter which employs quad pixel binning to again churn out bright good looking pics even when the conditions aren't amazing. My test shots came out pretty well, the ultra can grab quite natural images that still look sharp when you chuck them up on a telly or a monitor. And the final lens slapped on that rear end is a 12 meg portrait shooter with a 2x telephoto finish offering a narrow depth of field for a sexy bokeh style effect. Again this does its job pretty well, occasionally the edge detection will get a little confused and your subject will need to stay stock still in more ambient light or you'll get now but blur, but overall it is good stuff. Your home movies will look pretty ruddy good too as the Moto Edge 30 Ultra can record 8K res video or 4K video at 30 or 60 frames per second with the option of HDR10+. Colours are boosted slightly when shooting at 4K res or above, but overall the Ultra does a good job for capturing home movies or just clips to share online, with top notch stabilisation and some great audio pickup too. Even fairly blustery conditions don't balk the sound too much at all, although the focus does occasionally struggle in lower light. Flip to the front and you'll find a mighty 60 megapixel selfie snapper waiting to shoot your face. This again handles a range of conditions to keep you looking as sharp as possible, although it's not quite as effective for colour capture and it does struggle in much softer light unless you use the screen flash. I've also got to give a shout out to the Huawei Mate 50 Pro which boasts some incredible optics that are superior to pretty much anything out there in low light and ambient conditions. However, as is sadly the way with Huawei these days, you don't get any of those lovely Google services packed onto the P50 Pro which could be a deal breaker for many. And if you happen to know your way around a DSLR or two, well chances are you'll get on pretty bloody well with the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV and Xperia 5 Mark IV. These flagships boast the usual versatile professional camera tools and incredibly fast eye tracking, along with the ability to shoot 4K 120 frames per second video with all of the main lenses. And while I haven't yet tested out the more expensive Xperia 1 Mark IV, I have fully reviewed the Xperia 5 Mark IV, which boasts a more compact form yet still rocks pretty much the exact same specs, almost the same camera hardware and the same slick DSLR style shooting experience. When you first load it up, it'll be in basic mode. In this mode, you can swap between photo and video, and you can also shoot selfies using the front face in camera tech, if you like. Hello. However, you can cycle between the different modes just by tapping up here and then flicking on through them. In the auto mode, you've got very limited control. You can piddle about with the focal area and mode, and that's about it. The camera will basically handle everything else, although you can manually flick between the three different lenses as well. And then if you keep on flicking, you get to the likes of the programmable mode. In this mode, you can have a proper play around with the different white balance modes. You can control the ISO levels, the EV, and get exactly the kind of shot that you want. The Xperia 5 Mark IV's 12 meg 24mm primary sensor with optical image stabilisation can generally capture good looking pics on auto mode with minimal input and no heavy processing. But it does saturate HDR shots and it can struggle in all kinds of tricky lighting. The best performance comes from the program mode where you can quickly tinker with that EV, the ISO etc and you get to see the results accurately represented on screen. With some time and care you can get some great looking shots even when the light is in full on twat mode and it's very rare to see any lens flare or other issues like that. As well as that 24mm lens, you've got a 12 megapixel 16mm shooter that can capture an ultra wide snap when you need to fit more into frame, albeit with the usual impact on colour temperature. 
And you've also got a 12 meg telephoto shooter slapped on the back end, although it's not a variable range zoom lens like what you got in the Xperia 1. This one is locked at 60 mils, unfortunately, due to the general space constraints on this smartphone. This maxes out at a 7.5 times total zoom and the results are comparable to simple digital crops on ultra high res smartphone sensors, but it is still handy for getting a closer view of the action when you're shooting scenery or an unobtrusive family shot. The real-time eye autofocus is supported across all three lenses now, so just gives you a little bit of freedom to experiment with your shots. And Sony has apparently upgraded the real-time object tracking on here as well, using fresh new Clever Clogs AI shenanigans. Although it's tough to say how effective this upgrade has been because Sony phones have always been great at keeping action shots sharp. And the Mark IV is another banger in that respect. As long as you're not shooting in very low light, then people and pets will stay crisp. That's something that's helped along by the burst shot mode as well. Just hold down that shutter button, you'll get 20 frames per second auto exposure and auto focus as well, now with HDR support. For home movies, you'll want to swap to the Cinema Pro app. And in here, you can shoot 4K video at up to 120 frames per second, again with all three lenses, and once again, with full control over the camera settings and focus. However, shooting 4K footage at 30 frames per second, even just for a couple of minutes or so, does often cause a big, fat, nasty, warning, warning, phone is overheating message to flash up on the screen, which then disables a load of the features. So unless you're capturing really short clips, you do unfortunately tend to have to stick to full HD resolution. You will once again need to tinker with the settings to get the best possible results, of course, especially when you're shooting in ambient light, but the image stabilization is as great as ever. As long as you know your restraints, then you can get some good looking footage. You've got live streaming support built into this thing, so again, great news for creators. And if you happen to have a, a Sony Alpha DSLR as well, you can use this thing as an external monitor. And last up is the 12 meg selfie shooter, boasting a larger sensor than the previous generation for better low light results. It is still chunky at times, however, especially with brighter backgrounds. Definitely not as good as many rivals, unfortunately. And if you dive into the basic camera mode as well, you can also shoot video using that front-facing camera at up to 4K resolution. Absolutely does the job fine for a simple bit of vlogging like so, or you're Skyping your teams and all that good stuff. Now, it's that time of year where it seems like bloody dozens of fresh new smartphones are launching literally every day. For instance, the likes of the Honor Magic 5 Pro has just launched over in MWC 2023. I'm hoping to bring you a full review of that imminently. In fact, by the time this video goes live, I might have my unboxing up on the channel as well. It packs some very promising camera tech indeed, so fingers crossed that one is another winner. And if you find that your funds can't quite stretch to any of the smartphones I've mentioned in this best camera phones roundup, well, no worries. I have done a full roundup of my favorite budget camera phones as well, so definitely go check that out. And did I miss out any of your own favourites as well? Well, definitely clue me in as to what a massive knobber I am down in the comments below. And please do poke subscribe and ding that notifications bell. And have yourselves a bloody wonderful rest of the week. Cheers, everybody.